Hello, good evening, and welcome back. Welcome back, readers. It's me, Valerie Monroe, and my friend, Bookwormy. And that was a really, really scary part of the book we read yesterday. I know. If you were with us yesterday, reading down the swale, Brogdon had just um, gone down the stairs into the basement of John's house because he was hearing a very unusual sound, a yumming sound. And boy, was he surprised when he saw, and let me read back what he saw yesterday, John feeding a creature inside the tank and the creature had a long tail and fins and bumps and glistening black scales and two rows of long pointy razor sharp teeth. And last when we were reading this, Brogdon was screaming his head off. He was absolutely in terror. I would be too. Sounds very scary. Well, we're going to go on with the book today and see what's, what happens next. Can't wait. All right, you sit right here. This is Chapter 9, Maggie. John whirled around quickly. Brogdon, how, how did you ever get down here? John rushed over and bent to put his arms around Brogdon's shoulders as he tried to calm him. I, I, I followed you down here, Brogdon managed to stammer. He couldn't tear his eyes away from the creature, away from those teeth. Oh, dear, we didn't mean for you to see, for you to find out, John said softly. We would never want you to be frightened. You see, Maggie here, he pointed with his thumb to the creature swimming in the tank, is our little, well, our big secret. I'll say, Brogdon agreed, and he stole another shy look at the creature. She was making the yumming noise, and it sounded like it was coming from her throat. Why, why is she making that noise, Brogdon asked. She's just telling us that she loves her midnight snack, just like you enjoyed the chili, replied John. Would you like to feed her? I, I guess so, Brogdon said, his eyes wide with uncertainty. John reached into the container and handed one of the pellets to him. He then picked up Brogdon and held him near the top of the tank so he could toss it over. Maggie's body swirled around in the water, but her alert and sparkling eyes never left the pellet. It plunked into the water with a splash, and before it could be even begin to sink, Maggie's wide mouth closed around it, and again, Brogdon glimpsed those ferocious-looking rows of teeth. Yum. Yum, Maggie crooned while she chewed. Brogdon continued tossing the pellets into the tank, and Maggie, Maggie eagerly snatched each one until the container had just a few crumbs at the bottom. Then she looked searchingly from Brogdon to John, hoping for more. That's all there is, girl, John told her. You'll have to wait until breakfast. With that, Maggie lowered her eyelids, and Brogdon could see that they were fringed with long lashes. She flipped over and floated on her back, full and content. Brogdon looked up at John. His mind was reeling with questions. And then they started tumbling out like a rushing waterfall. Who is she? Why is she here? How did she get here? Is she the monster that all of the lake creatures are talking about? The ones that the frogs and fish are afraid of? Is she dangerous? Whoa there, little Brogdon, John laughed, holding up his hand to halt the interrogation. I'll tell you everything about Maggie, but first, come over here. There was a small bench in front of the tank, and John motioned for Brogdon to sit down. He then turned one of the empty containers upside down and sat on top of it so that they were facing each other. Despite the early hour, Brogdon felt more awake and alive than he had ever had in his entire life. If you remember, it is the middle of the night. First off, you're not in danger. You have my word, John began. But Maggie is, or was. What do you mean, Brogdon asked. Maggie had begun to snore in a gentle, low rumble as she continued floating on the water surface. You see, Mag Maggie's mother is named Morag. She lives in Loch Morar in Scotland. For years, people have been trying to capture her. Those same people would do anything to get their hands on Maggie, John began. 
Well, what would they do if they captured her? Brogdon asked. If that ever happened, and I am hoping it never does, she could be put on display in an aquarium or, John paused for a moment and his face darkened, she would be studied in a lab and he looked as though he wanted to say something else but decided against it. Let's just say there are plenty of greedy folks who'd love to have Maggie's head hanging on their wall or her teeth strung on a necklace. Plenty of folks who do anything for a little bit of fame and a pile of money. Both of them sat quietly mulling over his words. And for a few minutes, all that could be heard were Maggie's snores. Elaine belongs to a very special group of people, John went on. Scientists, guessed Brogdon? No, conservationists of unusual creatures of the sea, or kooks, C-O-U-C-S. Some people call them kooks, K-O-O-K-S. They think they're crazy in the head, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Elaine was a marine biology major in college. That means she studied the lives of animals that live in the seas and oceans. She was at the top of her class, but she wasn't satisfied with just studying whales or dolphins, he said. That's right, Brogdon, interjected a voice. John and Brogdon turned around. Elaine was standing there in a fuzzy bathrobe and slippers. You see, when I was seven years old, my family rented a house near a lagoon by the Chesapeake Bay for the summer. The backyard sloped down to the lagoon and a wooden dock stuck out into the water. I was allowed to play on the dock as long as I didn't go too close to the edge, she said. Brogdon smiled. It reminded him of the swale. Every morning I'd go outside into the backyard and sit on the dock, she continued, and watch the boats going by in the lagoon on their way to the bay, mostly small fishing and crabbing boats. I would stand on the dock and wave to the fishermen. Again, Brogdon thought of the swale and of all the things that floated by in its waters and of the red-capped gnome in the basket canoe. Well, one day I was sitting cross-legged out near the end of the dock reading a book. It was my favorite place to read. And I was, as I was turning a page of the book, which was a Nancy Drew mystery, by the way, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was two blackish lumps sticking up out of the surface of the water. I set down my book and stared because I wasn't sure what it was. Maybe it had just been the light playing tricks on the water, but no, all of a sudden a dark brown head rose out of the water. It was kind of small and looked like the head of a snake. I watched as its eyes moved slowly about, looking left and right. After a few moments, the head rose higher into the air, and I could see that it was attached to a very long neck, maybe two or three feet. Well, I must have coughed or made some sort of a noise. I can't remember exactly. All I know is that the teat creature turned and looked directly at me. Brogdon's eyes were wide with astonishment. He couldn't think of anything to say. I think it's important to mention here that I was pretty much a tomboy when I was growing up, Elaine pointed out. My mother had four boys before I came along, and when she finally had a daughter, she couldn't wait to put me in frilly dresses and buy me dolls to play with. But I wanted none of that. I loved nothing more than hanging around my older brothers and climbing trees, collecting bugs and worms, and watching birds from our tree fort. And reading, of course. Growing up with only brothers turned me into a pretty tough cookie. I've had more frogs put in my bed and spiders hidden in my hair than I can count. So when that creature rose out of the water and looked straight at me, I wasn't afraid at all. Quite the contrary, I just looked at it calmly and called out a hello to it, Elaine said. Wow, breathed Brogdon, and impressed. Maggie was still floating happily in the tank. Her snoring had ceased and she was now humming a tune in her sleep. It had a hauntingly beautiful sound. The creature swam over to me and introduced herself, Elaine went on. Chessie, that was her name. She informed me that she normally lived out in the bay, but that she had to keep on the move because fishermen were always trying to catch her with their nets or hooks. She had been on the run from them when she had gotten disoriented during the change in tides and wandered into the lagoon. She was friendly, asked Brogdon. She didn't try to harm you? Oh, goodness, no, Elaine laughed. Chessie was glad to have some conversation. She hung around our da dock for about a week. Each day I would sit out there and tell her about my brothers. 
And she told me all about her cousins, Nessie and Morag, who lived in Scotland, Champ, who lived in Lake Champlain, and Ogapogo, who lived in Lake Okanagan. She said they were all terribly misunderstood by humans who assumed that they were ferocious beasts. Elaine shook her head sadly at this. And then what, Brogdon asked. This is the part that's disturbing, John warned him. Then he said to Elaine, he may be too young to hear it. I'm not, I'm 13, Brogdon pleaded. Please tell me what happened. And that's where we'll stop for today. Now I want to show you something. Um, when Elaine was talking about being a little girl and growing up, and all the things she liked to do. She mentioned that when she met um, Chessie, she was sitting there reading a Nancy Drew book. And um, you may be familiar with the Nancy Drews. They're great mysteries to read. I have a whole collection of them. This one is called The Bungalow Mystery. And it's Nancy and her friends try to solve all kinds of mysteries. So if you're looking something for looking something looking for something wonderful to read, got a little tongue tied there. Um, try picking up a Nancy Drew. I've got um, probably about 50 of them sitting on my shelf. So we're going to pick up tomorrow and we'll find out more about Elaine and what happened to Chessie when she was a little girl. That was amazing. I can't believe she met a creature like that. It is pretty amazing. We are going to talk more about those creatures tomorrow. I can't wait. I really hope you'll join us tomorrow. I hope you'll be back. Keep on reading and we'll see you tomorrow. Keep on reading and be a bookworm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See you tomorrow.